Without further ado, uh, the paper is titled Baudelaire's Shadows Toward a Theory of Poetic Determination. It might seem that the distinction between form and content applied to poetry roughly corresponds to the classical philosophical distinction between form and matter. But this is not the case. In fact, the matter of the poem evades the distinction between form and content, falling into neither category. And it is difficult to assign it a precise value with respect to their relationship. So for example, as a synthesis of the two, or as a supplemental third term participating in neither. It is not that we have a series of three terms, form, content, matter, but that the philosophical distinction between form and matter intervenes in, perhaps interrupts, the distinction between form and content. This has something to do with the function of signs. Their arrangement, form, as material units, matter, determines their meaning, content. But to treat them as material units, and thus to register the form determination of their content through material arrangement, is to perceive them as strangely contentless. This paradoxical structure constitutes the existence of signs. The materiality of the sign is its inscription or enunciation, yet its function as sign exceeds the materiality of its inscription or enunciation. The existence of signs is irreducible to either physical facticity or ideal sense. This very irreducibility constitutes their existence. The form of the poem depends upon this existence, mediated as it is by the fraught relationship between matter and meaning. Put differently, form is constituted by the weaving together of the existence of signs, rather than constituted at the level of their physical instantiation or semantic content. Thus, we have introduced a new concept into consideration, the determination of which is unaccounted for by distinctions between form and content or form and matter, the existence of the sign or the existence of the poem. Weaving signs into complex forms only comes into focus when we traverse these distinctions, uh, form content, form matter, while holding them apart and considering their intricate, perhaps paradoxical relations. I propose that attention to the specific level of the existence of the poetic sign and of the poem itself requires an analysis of what I call poetic determination, designating thereby the asymmetrical mediations between form and content, form and matter, and also between these two distinctions. Uh, the, con the mediations that construct the existence of poems through the configuration of signs in the specificity of their existence. The analysis of poetic determination requires us to resist interpretive reductions of the poem that would ignore or mitigate any aspect of these mediations. It has been said that a poem should not mean but be. Attention to poetic determination settles upon neither the meaning nor the being of the poem, but upon its existence. So we could say, neither sein nor sin, but Dasein. Poetic determination, the being there of the poem. Poetic determination is neither prior to nor subsequent to form, content, or matter, but rather the complex composition of their mediating articulation. If we read for this reticent dimension of poetic language, we will find that instances of poetic indeterminacy do not dissolve the determination of the poem, but rather display it. Interpretive indeterminacy is not the undoing of poetic determination, but the mark of its insistence. Now, how to specify and to think the determinacy of the literary work is among the motivating problems of Macheret's Pierre Macheret's 1965 book for a theory of literary production. And the parameters of this problem, the problem of the determinacy of the literary work, lend the book much of its conceptual torque. Uh, so part of the, this paper is partly written for a volume on, on Macheret's uh, book for a theory of literary production. So I'll spend some time on Macheret for now. Throughout the opening section of the book, Macheret repeatedly foregrounds the concept of determination as crucial to recognizing the specificity of the literary work and approaching it through critical rationality. Quote, the work is, is thus determined, Macheret tells us. It is itself and nothing other. The moment this is understood, it becomes the object of a rational study. For Macheret, understanding the determinacy of the literary work is the key to developing a rational materialist approach to literary criticism that would avoid the several methodological illusions he diagnoses. He calls these the empiricist, the normative, and the interpretive. So the empiricist, quickly, the empiricist illusion is the notion that the text is just sort of there as a datum, 
um, which is accessible uh, as just like something which is there without elaboration. Um, the normative illusion, um, he says, proposes to modify the work so as to absorb it more thoroughly, seeing the work as merely the provisional manifestation of a still unrealized intention. That's the normative illusion. And the interpretive illusion, he says, unmakes the work so that one can remake it in the image of its meaning, making it designate directly what had been indirectly expressed. That's the interpretive. So uh, empiricist, normative, interpretive illusions. Okay. Um, so, but what does this mean? Uh, that the determinacy of the literary work is the key to developing a rational materialist approach to literary criticism. How is one to understand this primary criterion of materialist criticism, and what are its methodological consequences? What are we to make of the tautological implications of the claim that the work is itself and nothing other? Macheret will foreground these implications in the following description of literary language. He says, the novelty of this language consists in the fact that the only meaning it has is that it is given, having nothing apparently behind it or before it, not being haunted by any foreign presence. This language is autonomous insofar as it is effectively without depth, its surface entirely unfolded. Thus, in order to distinguish itself from ordinary language, it fundamentally has no need to coin new words. Weaving them into the relations of the text, words are made into something other than words. And, once torn from their ordinary connections and inaugurated into a different order, a new reality emerges. We will say again that this transmutation consists entirely in the production of a tautology. A literary production is the production of a tautology. And Macheret is equally clear that literary criticism is a practice that must, somehow, explicate the work without compromising its tautological character. He says, the work must be elaborated, treated, or else it will never be a theoretical fact, an object of knowledge. But it must also be left as it is, or else one will bring to bear upon it a value judgment and not a theoretical judgment. So to the tautological character of literary production corresponds this double exigency of literary criticism, to elaborate the work and yet to leave it as it is. How can we meet this double exigency? Macheret makes two claims about the determinacy of the literary work that enable us to clarify the double exigency of critical activity. So one, quoting, the necessity of the work is founded upon the multiplicity of its meanings. Okay, the necessity of the work. Two, the work exists above all through its determinate absences, through what it does not say, through its relation to what it is not. Okay, the first thesis requires us to elaborate the complexity of the work rather than reducing it to a unitary meaning. meaning. He says one must know how to distinguish the real complexity that composes the work and one must know as well how to recognize in this complexity the sign of its necessity. The necessity of the work through which it is, quote, precisely determined, resides in the complex discrepancy of its sense rather than in the unified causality of an, in of an intention or historical cause. Thus, what he calls a true interrogation of the work will not uncover a hidden meaning or reveal a depth from which it emerges. Rather than seeking the ideal plenitude of the work, it will, quote, have as its object that hollow speech the work discreetly proffers, and measure therein the distance that separates several meanings." Unquote. Without exchanging the work for its meaning, one will display the conflict of meanings that constitutes its existence. One will trace along the surface the complexity of sense that makes the work what it is. The critic will not draw the process of literary production back to the germ from which it emerges. He says, in a genesis which is only the inverted image of an analysis, the genetic fallacies that Naomi was discussing, but rather, quote, make evident the real process of its constitution by showing how a real diversity of elements compose the work and give it consistency. This brings us to Macheret's second thesis, suggesting that the determinate absences constituting the work through what it does not say lie in those distances dividing it from the unity of sense it might otherwise compose. What it is not is thus within the work, in the distances between meanings composing its complex consistency. These determinate absences bear upon the relation of literary production to ideology. 
to the givenness of words and to the empirical reality they index in ordinary language. That ordinary and tacit language upon which literature works and which it transforms. The distance that separates the literary work from ideology through the transformation of ideology reappears within the work as the distance that separates several meanings. Distinguishing the real diversity of elements that compose it and preventing its complexity from collapsing into unity. In a suggestive formulation, Macheret tells us that, quote, this distance that separates the work from ideology, uh, uh, from this distance that separates the work from the ideology it transforms is encountered in its very letter. It not only separates the work from ideology, um, this distance, it also separates, uh, it separates it also from itself, unmaking it even as it is made. So a double distance between the work and ideology and internal to the work. The problem for the critic, however, is that the literary work, having been composed, may now itself be taken as something given, as just a datum. And if we relate to it thus, the empiricist illusion, we reproduce the givenness of ideology from which it had distanced itself through the work of transformation. So the critic will have to institute another distance, adjoining to that of the distance of the work from ideology and to the distance within the work, separating its diversity of elements. Moreover, it is because the work is determined, because, Machere says, nothing can be changed, no statement can be added to its discourse that would not be only commentary, that this distance is both possible and necessary. The critic will construct a form of knowledge that is appended to the work, thus both leaving it as it is and elaborating its complexity by drawing out the internal rifts and separations that compose it. <coughs> Machere formulates the conditions according to which we can meet the double exigency of materialist criticism as follows. So quoting, to understand is thus not to recover or to reconstitute a latent meaning, forgotten or hidden. It is to constitute a new knowledge, a knowledge which is appended to the reality from which it begins and thus bespeaks something else. Let us remember that the idea of the circle is not itself circular. It is not because the circle is there that there is the idea of the circle. And recall that the advent of knowledge institutes a distance, a certain rift, the French is a carte, that's my translation. Uh, delimiting through this rift the initial domain, it makes a measurable space, an object of knowledge. Okay, so literary criticism constructs a new, object, uh, a new knowledge by determining the literary work through exposition, thereby constituting it as an object of rational study. And the establishment of this rift between empirical datum and object of study is the very means by which the work is both elaborated and left as it is, uh, by which the production of a tautology is accorded its rights. In what follows, I'll try to demonstrate the coherence of this apparent paradox through a treatment of the final tercet of a major work, Baudelaire's sonnet Obsession, which itself articulates, divides, and dislocates a major figural locus in Les Fleurs du Mal and in 19th century poetry more broadly. I'll try to show how it is possible to read the function of metaphor in this tercet in such a way that it not only separates poetic from ordinary language through metaphor, but also counters the operation of metaphor, suspending its movement so as to open a distance or gap internal to its function. The suspension is enabled by what a word does not say, by the rifts in its significance that render it finite, determinate. Machere claims that what the word does not say, it manifests, it lays bare in its very letter. It is made of nothing other. This silence, he says, gives it its existence. I'll try to show how the manifestation of the poem's silence lays bare the specificity of this existence registering the peculiar reticence of this dimension of poetic language. And I'll try to show how measuring the distances of the poem from ordinary language and within its own discourse uh, is necessary to grasp the conflicts that agitate it. That is, I'll try to construct the discourse of the poem to elaborate the discrepant, coordinated, and complex layers of its figural articulation in such a way as to situate the work within the element of its displacements. If, quote, the work draws its form from an incompleteness insofar as its necessity is determined by absence, by lack, unquote, and if this is what we must analyze, 
Machere tells us that rather than that of structure, the essential concept of such analysis will be that of dislocation, décalage, key word in L27. <laughs> um, that sentence is left out of the English translation of the, the book. <laughs> rather than structure, the essential concept is, is that of décalage, dislocation. Uh, the construction, elaboration, and citing of such dislocation will be the work of the analysis that follows toward a theory of poetic determination adequate to the double exigency of literary criticism and to the reticent facticity of the poem's existence. Um, the attentive reader of Baudelaire's obsession encounters an interpretive crux at the end of the first line of the poem's final tercet. But let me read the whole poem uh, in French and then in English. Uh, Obsession, grand bois, vous m'effrayez comme des cathédrales, vous hurlez comme l'orgue, et dans nos cœurs maudits, chambres d'éternel duit, où vibrent des vieux râles, uh, répondent les échos de vos déprofondies. Je te hais au sien, tes bandes et tes tumultes, mon esprit les retrouve en lui. Ce rire amer de l'homme vaincu, plein de sanglots et d'insultes, je l'entends dans le rire énorme de la mer. Comme tu me plairais aux nuits, sans ces étoiles dans la lumière parle un langage connu, car je cherche le vide et le noir et le nu. Mais les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles, vives, jaillissant de mon oeil par milliers, des êtres disparus au regard familier. And in English, uh, my translation of the poem, great woods, you frighten me like cathedrals, you howl like the organ, and in our damned hearts, chambers of eternal mourning where old death rattles vibrate, respond the echoes of your day profundus. I hate you, ocean, your swells and your tumults, my mind finds them in itself, this bitter laughter of the vanquished man full of sobs and insults, I hear in the enormous laughter of the sea. How you please me, O oh night, without these stars whose light seeks, seeks a language, or sorry, speaks a language we know, for I seek the void and the black and the bare. The shadows themselves are canvases where live, bursting from my eye by thousands, those, van those vanished beings with familiar gazes. So it's this word, this, this translation, canvases, um, but not necessarily the translation, but the sense of the word toile that I'll be focusing on at some length. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the attentive reader of Baudelaire's obsession encounters this interpretive crux at the end of the first line of the poem's final tercet. Okay, so, mais les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles, ou vives, jaillissant de mon oeil par milliers, des êtres disparus au regard familier. So, we'll have to spend some time unraveling the significance of the word toile in this tercet especially since it serves as the vehicle of a metaphor for which teneb is the tenor. A major signifier not only in Les Fleurs du Mal, but in the romantic tradition that precedes it and which it delimits, Les Ténèbres links an exterior phenomenal condition of darkness or shadow with an interior spiritual or intellectual condition of doubt, ignorance, incertitude, or unease, potentially fusing these exterior and interior senses in the medium of a general obscurity. Uh, this synthesis of phenomenal and spiritual shadow is also drawn in relation, into relation through connotation with the liturgical office des ténèbres, and thus with the extinguishing one by one of the candles illuminating a church, uh, with the singing of lamentations and the recitation of psalms. It's quite ambiguous that, through the rhetoric of metaphor, the sense of this major romantic signifier, ténèbres, is determined uh, by the word toile. Right, so les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles. But the meaning of this determination is itself ambiguous. We'll have to explicate this ambiguity in order to register, elaborate, and begin to theorize the complex dialectic of indeterminacy and determination at issue in this line in this tercet. And indeed, we'll have to think through what kind of dialectic this relationship between indeterminacy and determination entails. So most generally, the noun toile uh, denotes a woven textile, a fabric. More specifically, it may refer to an artist's canvas, or by synecdoche, a painting, um, in the way that we say a canvas. We, you know. um, or to a tapestry, as in uh, La Toile de Penelope, right? Penelope's um, 
uh, shroud, um, or to a theater backdrop, toile de fond. In these cases, the word denotes the fabric of an artistic composition, the surface upon which one paints, within, one weaves a, within which one weaves a scene, or before which a scene is enacted. The term might also refer to the canvas of a sail, as it sometimes does in Baudelaire. Um, but toile can also denote a spider's web, uh, as in toile d'araignée, um, and thus a network of filaments woven by an arachnid rather than a human being and upon which living prey rather than artistic compositions are captured. In this sense, the mesh of the textile is both a home and a trap. And we can uh, see how these connotations may be figuratively associated with the fabric of artistic representation, as for example in Maya Darren's Meshes of Afternoon, uh, or the funeral shroud uh, Penelope weaves and unravels, detaining the suitors and linking death, mourning, and capture with the duplicity of artistic making and unmaking. One might then seek a synthetic meaning of the metaphor determining tenebre as d'étoile, uh, a symbol combining an artist's spider as a figure of a constructive um, yet obscure making, poiesis, at once domestic and uncanny, dangerous and sustaining, natural and surreal, intentional and unconscious, as in Joanne Kiger's book, uh, her first book, The Tapestry and the Web. She writes, and what am I? A flower, a deer, a spider waiting for the breeze to speed my weaving, the reverie of memory past what I know. The role that Kiger attributes to her lyric speaker, a spider waiting as it, re as it weaves the reverie of memory, is attributed by Deleuze to the narrator of uh, Proust's Recherche um, in his book Proust and Signs. He writes, the search is not constructed like a, th like a cathedral or a gown, but like a web. The spider narrator whose web is the search being spun, being woven by each thread, stirred by one sign or another. The web and the spider, the web and the body are one and the same machine. But before leaping to this kind of synthetic, symbolic reading of Baudelaire's figure, let us remain for now at the level of denotation, where we confront an ordinary interpretive ambiguity whose complexities we need to consider before constructing an adequate approach to the final tercet of the poem and to the figural determination of Tenebre. So the ambiguity of denotative reference is foregrounded if we consider the problem of translation. So in my view, d'étoile could most plausibly be translated by either canvases or webs. And the problem is that these are equally plausible. In her prose translation, uh, Frances Scarf uh, chooses canvases, as do Walter Martin, William Aguilar, Roy Campbell, and J.E. Tidball, among others. Uh, Cyril Scott opts, opts for veils, uh, but the French is not voile, um, which would also have rhymed with étoile in the previous tercet and might have served as an apt figure for les ténèbres, veils. Um, Jack Squire translates toile as curtain, but that corresponds more closely to le voile, or le rideau. Uh, James McGowan gives a screen, but I would say this usage is perhaps overdetermined by the anachronistic context of cinema. Uh, Richard Howard avoids the problem along, this, along with the sense of the entire tercet, I would say, uh, by not translating the word at all. So he offers, um, yet even shadows have their shapes which lives, which live where I imagine them to be the hordes of vanished souls whose eyes acknowledge mine. So here the place of d'étoile is occupied by their shapes, which has little to do with the semantic field of the French term. Uh, in her book Dead Time, Alyssa Martyr, um, collaborating with Jeff Bennington, uh, she retranslates all the passages from Baudelaire that she cites because she doesn't feel that we have an adequate translation. Um, she offers a more direct translation of the, the first line of the tercet, she writes, uh, translates, but the shadows are themselves canvases. I think that works, and so I would translate the two tercets of the sonnet uh, as you have them on the handout, how you please me, O night, without these stars whose light speaks, speaks a language we know, for I seek the void and the black and the bare, but the shadows are themselves canvases where live bursting from my eye by thousands, those vanished beings with familiar gazes. So the problem is when you translate, you have to determine the indeterminacy of the word in a way that is not adequate to its ambiguity in this case. But the choice of canvases would seem confirmed by Claude Pichois's notes to the Pleiad, um, indicating an earlier draft in which Upin had been written and erased where we now find Uvive. Pichois conjectures that Baudelaire had erased pain, paint, right, um, 
without completing the verb, arguing rather too forcefully that without doubt, Baudelaire would have written ou se peigne, or where are painted. In his signal essay on the relationship between obsession and Baudelaire's correspondence, Paul de Mon argues that given the existence of this previous draft, Pain confirms the reading of Toile as the device by means of which painters, this is a quotation, as the device by means of which painters or dramatists project the space or stage of representation. He asserts that the metaphoric crossing between perception and hallucination occurs in the final tercet by means of the paraphernalia of painting, which is also that of recollection and recognition as the recovery to the senses of what seemed to be forever beyond experience. So for Demon, a lot hinges upon the paraphernalia of painting in the poem. Yet Baudelaire, in fact, erases the verb pain. Uh, eliminating it from the published version of the sonnet. So while Demand's reference to a draft secures the determinacy of his reading, Baudelaire's erasure actually points up the indeterminate denotation of the noun toile, uh, as does the word with which he replaces pain in the draft, vive, indicating that something lives on these canvases, or perhaps more likely, webs. The verb weave, or sorry, vive, uh, sustains the indeterminate denotation of toile, and we might note the curious effect whereby the indeterminacy of denotative reference, and thus translation, indicates the determinacy of the French signifier itself. The word in the poem is toile. Because of its complex indeterminacy, it cannot be translated or replaced by an apparently synonymous French word. If one understands that the word could mean either canvases or webs, that is an indeterminacy uh, introduced by the poem's reception, and a divided determinacy introduced by interpretation, but not by the poem. And the poem merely presents a signifier there in its place, and the poet only decides on the word, not its interpretation. Insofar as one necessarily introduces indeterminacy into this determinacy, one is a hypocrite lecteur. The ambiguity of denotative reference emphasizes the inadequacy of translation to the connotative field of the word. And this inadequacy, in turn, shows the obvious inadequacy of approaching poetic language through denotative reference. The poetic usage of toile in this passage is specific insofar as it not only includes the connotative field of the word, but shifts it beyond the lexical determinations of the dictionary, requiring a construction of the sense of the word and thus the figure at the level of the poem. This figural sense should also be weighed, I would argue, within the larger field of sense constituted by Le Fleur du Mal that is, at the level of the literary work. And here we touch upon Machere's suggestive reference to weaving in his characterization of the power of literary language to distinguish itself from the usage of words in ordinary language. He says, weaving them into uh, the relations of a text, it makes of words something other than words. Um, and once torn from their ordinary connections and inaugurated into a different order, a new reality emerges. So we have to construct through critical activity what we have to construct <coughs> is this new reality constituted by the final tercet of obsession, rather than merely the meaning of the words with which it is woven. With Machere's own metaphor in mind, he says, tissant, um, uh, weaving them into relations of a text. We might be tempted to suggest that the weaving of the word toile into the poem figures the function of poetic language itself. But before we can consider such an understanding of the metaphor, les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles, we first have to work with the words that are woven, woven, situating them within the referential field of the work. So if we begin to reconstruct the weaving of words through les fleurs du mal, uh, we find that Baudelaire uses the plural noun toile only twice in the volume. We have a concordance of uh, the book, which is very helpful for these, for these matters. So only, he only uses the plural noun twice. Uh, so once in obsession and once in sepulteur, uh, where it also rhymes with étoile. Uh, and so you have a, a part of this poem in your handout. Um, à l'heure où les chasses d'étoiles ferment leurs yeux appesantis, l'araignée y fera ses toiles et les vipères ses petits. Um, at the hour in which the chaste stars close their heavy eyes, there the spider makes her webs and the viper her brood. Her little ones. Um, so here, toile does indeed refer to the webs of a spider, weaving these under a sky in which the stars have closed their eyes. Sepulteur 
precedes Obsession by eight poems in the 1861 edition. Uh, and the proximity of the poems links the spider's webs of the former poem, Sepulter, uh, to the usage of toile in the latter, Obsession. Especially since um, the fourth spleen poem, located immediately before Obsession, refers to spiders tightening their filaments, ses filets, uh, at the bottom of the speaker's brain. Yet in La Musique, uh, the poem just prior to Sepulter, the word toile clearly refers to a sail, and canvas is the contextually clear sense of the word in each of the six other instances in which Baudelaire uses the singular noun. So there it's con contextually obvious that it means canvas. When Pichois points us to the earlier draft of Obsession, he links his conjecture that Baudelaire would have written Ousse Pen uh, with a figure of the damned painter um, in the poem actually titled Tenebre. Um, which is the first part of the, the sequence, uh, Un Fantôme. Um, and so there, Baudelaire writes, I'll just read the English, uh, I am like a painter, a mocking god, condemned to paint, alas, upon shadows. Uh, sur les ténèbres. Indeed, Baudelaire himself links these two poems, sending them together to Poulet uh, Malassi and asking him in a letter of March 13th, 1860, have you received Obsession and Un Fantôme? In the latter poem, the shadow canvas is the medium of creative futility, an unstable obscurity by which a mocking god condemns artistic production to failure. Uh, and Pichois also points us to a passage in Artificial Paradises in which Baudelaire describes the singular faculty of perceiving, or rather of creating, upon the fecund canvas of shadows, a whole world of bizarre visions. C'est la toile féconde des ténèbres. So here the shadow canvas is a figure of imaginative fecundity rather than artistic damnation. And this seems more closely aligned with the toile of obsession upon which the gazes of vanished beings live, bursting from my eye by thousands. Whether damnation or fecundity is at issue, the figure of the shadow canvas is certainly woven through Baudelaire's texts. Pichois suggests as well in his notes to Un Fantôme that Baudelaire has in mind uh, two lines from Shelley's The Revolt of Islam um, that are quoted directly in Artificial Paradises. Um, the lines are, with hue like that when some great painter dips his pencil in the gloom of earthquake and eclipse. And there it's, the gloom is la noirceur. Uh, Baudelaire quotes these lines, however, to complete his description of, quote, a somber epoch, vast network of shadows, torn at intervals by rich and overwhelming visions. And so there, um, I've translated uh, uh, the network of shadows um, corresponds to vast réseau de ténèbres, um, torn at intervals by rich and overwhelming visions. So a network of shadows torn at intervals calls to mind a spider's web, I think, rather than a canvas the articulated form of the, of the web between um, nodal points. And Baudelaire then calls uh, on Shelley's figure of a painter dipping a brush into la noirceur in order to evoke the somber hue of this network of shadows. So if we arrive again at the synthesis of web and painting, at the compound figure of the artist spider, we can now consider what would be at stake in foregrounding this synthetic interpretation of Baudelaire's metaphor, mais les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles. So at first we were confronted with the general denotation of the word toile, a textile of some kind. In context, we find this denotative reference divided, either a spider's web or artist's canvas, at least. If we decide on canvases, the poem ends with the gazes of vanished beings leaping from paintings, and Baudelaire was certainly obsessed with the tenebrous glint of oil paint. If we read Toile as webs, the poem ends in a disturbing figuration of the familiar gazes of vanished beings as the eyes of thousands of spiders, or perhaps their prey, uh, suddenly bursting from the speaker's own gaze. And this is a superb Baudelarian figure for the psychology of obsession. But this referential division is redoubled by a new decision. Okay, either this indeterminacy of reference, web or canvas, or its determinant synthetic resolution, canvas web, artist spider. The synthetic uh, 
resolution would unify the act of looking at a painting with that of weaving a poem. And the difficult adequacy of this compound figure uh, to this compound, complex sense would testify, as usual, uh, that Baudelaire is an artist equal to the demands of his obsessions. The familiar gazes of the vanished beings summoned by the poem's final line suggest the gazes of the dead, implicitly figured as the lightless intervals of vanished stars. And whether we read Toile as canvas web or the canvas web of the, of the spider artist, there is the troubling uh, crossing of perception and hallucination noted by Damon. If gazes are bursting from my eye, then the gaze of the viewer is not met by familiar constellations, but is rather the origin of what it encounters, such that the distinction between the production and reception of phenomena is collapsed. We could say that the poem ends with the glint of mediation between phenomenal reception and production. The mingling of the living and the dead, des êtres disparus, in the uncanny familiarity of shadows, of darkness, or of doubt. The thematics of mediation are thus rhetorically mediated by a split figure held together by a single word, toile. And the poem is determinate insofar as one must account for the multiple senses of the same word and include them in its field of meaning. Note that we have moved dialectically from a general unity of denotative reference, a woven textile of some kind, to a specific unity of figural reference, the canvas web of the spider artist, by traversing a division of the general denotation, either web or canvas, and its potential recomposition at the level of poetic rather than prosaic meaning. But again, the very possibility of this determinate synthesis merely shifts the level of interpretive indeterminacy from a division between two senses, web or canvas, to the problem of whether or not these senses should be unified by a figural synthesis, the canvas web. If we can move from indeterminacy to determinate synthesis, we have to decide whether we should do so. What if the indeterminacy of Baudelaire's poetic usage is itself crucial to its meaning? That is, what if the denotative split itself, suspended prior to dialectical integration, is the tenor of the metaphor? Um, an especially pressing question, considering that its vehicle, tenebre, signifies not only uh, sensory obscurity, but also cognitive irresolution, doubt. Irresolvable semantic ambiguity itself, rather than its dialectical resolution, would be an aptly negative figure of shadows, or of darkness, or of doubt. But now, just as we move to retain indeterminacy as the metaphorical tenor, right, we once again arrive at its determination. That is, we produce a, a determinate reading of the tenor as the indeterminacy of meaning, rather than a meaning that we select. Noting this dialectical structure, which at once resolves and frustrates our interpretive efforts, spiraling them outward, let us tarry a little further with the potential field of meaning uh, the final tercet of obsession opens and participates in within Les Fleurs du Mal. Then we can attempt to filter what Macheret calls the interpretive illusion and the empiricist illusion from our method, approaching the determination of Baudelaire's poetic language in a manner that does not give way to the infinite progress of dialectical displacement concealed by the apparent resolution of interpretive decision. If the interpretive ambiguity of Toile involves a hermeneutic dialectic of indeterminacy and determination, this very dialectic and the problem of mediation it involves is also a major um, theme of the, fines, of the poem's final tercets. The seeker speaks, or sorry, seeks the indeterminacy of absolute negation. So again, for I seek the void and the black and the bare. But what he finds is the mitigated indeterminacy of shadows or darkness or doubt mediating between the well-known language of the constellations and the nothingness of the absolute void. Mais les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles. Ténèbres would seem to signify the phenomenal and spiritual determinacy of mediating negation, darkness, um, or shadows or doubt, a medium of obscurity that is not an absolute absence of light, but rather a lack of it, in which relative darkness is itself a source of reflexive uncertainty, a delimited region of darkness evoking an unseen sensible form. Uh, that's actually the, the Trésor de la Langue Française uh, mentions this as a, um, a sense of tenebre, that it denotes a region in which some sensible form may be obscured. Um, the figuration of Les Ténèbres by Détoile determines the void through mediation, 
constituting a bounded space with a chiasmus of phenomenal productivity and reception is delimited from the groundless howling of great woods, the enormous laughter of the sea, and the absolute negation of the void, the black, and the bear, figures of the sublime that we encounter in the poem's two quatrains in the first tercet. What remains of the banished stars is not nothing but the trace of their absence, the familiar gazes of vanished beings. The registration of their residual existence requires a spontaneous faculty of perception, jaillissant de mon oeil, that makes them appear within the locus of their disappearance, yet still surprises the perceiver through the involuntary suddenness of this productive activity. As in Hegel's logic, the problem of the relation between absolute negation, pure being or pure nothingness, and the negativity of finite determinacy or mediation runs through les fleurs du mal. But when Hegel reclaims the true as the whole through absolute knowledge or the idea, the movement of the concept comes to include all the contradictions in the plenitude of infinite mediation, rendering the absolute determinate rather than void. The absolute for Hegel is not the void and the black and the bare, it must be produced through mediation. Does Baudelaire's poetry and the metaphor that we've been studying move towards such a determinacy, a determinacy of the absolute? Is Baudelaire a poet of determinate infinity, recovered through mediation, as in Hegel, or is he a poet of the finitude of all determinacy? How is the contradiction between these potential poetic commitments itself mediated in Les Fleurs du Mal? The composition of the book involves a testing of possible poetic stances, of declarative and affective inclinations frequently ironized as poses through the mutually destabilizing relationship of different moods or personae mobilized in the volume. But it also involves a recursive clarification and sharpening of certain norms. For example, although we veer between infernal abasement and heavenly elevation, between spleen and ideal, in him to beauty, the attribution of beauty's origin to either God or Satan is a matter of indifference, since it is the singular qualities marking beauty's advent, rhythm, fragrance, glimmer, uh, which, quote, open the door of an infinite that I love and have never known. So beauty opens the door of an infinite, but does not render it fully attainable. It is a glimmer rather than a blinding sun or an ideal form. And this is a privileged term, lueur, uh, for the phenomenal glimmer, uh, for the phenomenal experience of fleeting singularities in Les Fleurs du Mal. Yet this word also designates the maliciously gleaming eyes of the old man in Les Sept Vieillards, uh, a gleam that portends his auto multiplication into a potentially infinite series of doubles. The bad infinity of this repetition, which horrifies the speaker, leaves his soul like a barge without sails upon a monstrous and unbounded sea. Here, a fleeting phenomenal singularity, lueur, again, portends a potentially infinite replication of identity that cancels phenomenal particularity, giving way to an unbearably boundless indeterminacy. Yet to render this conversion of singularity into boundlessness in a poem is to determine it through the bounded negation of that boundlessness to give it form, if you like. Neither pure negation, the void and the black and the bear, nor phenomenal singularity, the malicious glimmer of an eye, can be inscribed directly in a poem. In order to be evoked, absolute indeterminacy, pure singularity, or infinite repetition have to undergo the shadowy determinacy of mediation, the formal boundedness of the poem, the material inscription of writing, the receptive production of meaning. Tenebre, whether it means shadows, darkness, or doubt, is one among the names in Les Fleurs du Mal for the determinacy of mediation, the imperfection of the absolute against which the poem may strain, but which it cannot escape. Like Baudelaire's allegorical swan, dying of thirst beside a waterless gutter, the poet is a malcontent who twists a convulsive neck toward the sky as if addressing reproaches to God. That's from Le Cine. Um, in correspondence, phenomenal singularities read as signs mingle in a shadowy and profound unity, and certain scents are said to partake of the expansion of infinite things. But it is in Baudelaire's greatest poem, Le Signe, uh, that the forest of symbols evoked as the temple of nature in correspondence becomes the forest of my mind's exile, where the poet thinks of starving orphans parched as flowers, of the captives, of the vanquished, and of many more. Baudelaire's poetic achievement reaches its pinnacle not with the attainment of the infinitely harmonious mediation sounded in correspondence, but in the voice of a speaker, quote, oppressed by an image of a dirty swan whose mad gestures are like exiles, ridiculous and sublime, and gnawed by an insatiable desire. 
This is the insatiable desire for the void, for the black and the bear, the poet seeks, a desire for infinite negation that in fact gives way to the finitude of determinate ex existence. Like the infinite beyond the open door in Hymn to Beauty or the thousands of vanished beings mentioned in Obsession, the many more evoked at the end of Lucine can only be gestured toward. They cannot all be included within the finitude of the poem's determinacy. The movement from the penultimate stanza, uh, or the penultimate tercet to the final tercet of obsession, from for I seek to but, suggests that Baudelaire is a poet of finite determinacy. The grammatical situation of his shadows um, confirms that they are not a determinate figure of the infinite, but a concession, but, um, to, find, to the finitude of determinacy. It is the grammar of the poem's final sentence that positions the sense of its metaphorical rhetoric. May is in this sense the most important word in the poem, not an absolute negation, but a mediating qualification. Um, and it would be an aptly deflationary claim to place it among the most important words in Baudelaire's oeuvre. All indeterminacy to which a poem gives rise is produced by its concession to determinacy. Infinite indeterminacy is a function of the fact that the poem cannot be more than it is, does not say more than what it says, is finite. If the word can mean either canvases or webs, it only is toile. The existence of the word is irremediably determinate. Rather than choosing among interpretive indeterminacies, we are trying to situate its determinate existence. Let us recall some of Machere's theses. What the work does not say makes it what it is. The necessity of the work is founded upon the multiplicity of its meanings. Elaborating the work, the activity of critical interrogation institutes a certain distance or rift between the object, uh, the subject and the object of knowledge, delimiting a measurable space and measuring within it the distance of several meanings. Unlike Sepulteur, the work obsession does not say l'araignée. Right, determining des toiles as spider's webs. Unlike the earlier draft of the poem, the work does not say Upin, right, determining des toiles as an artist's canvas. Measuring the distance between these meetings, we could say that the metaphor assembles the compound figure, suggesting the glint of both oil paint and spider's eyes, while synthesizing nature and artifice, poesis and techne, life and representation, through the indiscernibility of web painting or theatrical backdrop. A vast network of conceptual implications is at issue in Baudelaire's metaphor, in the torn interval between nature and culture, the artist and the spider. We could say that the core of the figure determining les ténèbres as des toiles is its duplicity, the sinister suggestion of the spider's web lurking behind the more immediate recognition of the artist's canvas, thus bursting from the reader's apprehension of the connotative field of des toiles. We could construct an account of how the grammar in which rhetoric, uh, rhetoric is couched, the may, positioning the metaphor, intervenes in logical relations among figures of mediation in Les Fleurs de Mal, delimiting the pursuit of absolute negation by drawing it back into a shadowy dialectic of appearance and disappearance, familiarity and unfamiliarity, life and death. So far, we have done as much. However, we could also note that none of these approaches to the final tercet of the poem really suffice to make sense, actually, of the figural distortions that they trace. Paul de Mon suggests that obsession is characterized by what he refers to as figural stability. Um, and this may be true of the opening quatrains in the first tercet of the poem. That is, we readily grasp the Gothic chill linking woods and cathedrals, uh, the subject of anguish exteriorized in the tumults of the sea, or the yearning for absolute negation extrapolated from the desire um, for a starless sky. But, may, the problem presented in the final tercet is that its metaphor does not produce a stable figure. One cannot quite compose an image of where these vanished beings live, of where their familiar gazes reside as they are encountered bursting from my eye. The difficulty is that the poetic sense is at once too indeterminate, d'étoile, and too specific, ou vive. Um, its complex determination is situated at the crux of its indeterminate specificity, riven by an irreconcilability of the general and the particular. This, I think, is why Daman, in order to stabilize his claim that we all perfectly and quickly understand obsession, and that obsession translates the other sonic correspondences into intelligibility, 
Um, while correspondences, on the other hand, remains as thoroughly incomprehensible as it always was, in order for de Mon to make this claim, he has to stabilize the meaning of the word toile by referring to the previous draft, thus stabilizing the figure itself and the possibility of representation that it asserts. In fact, the figural ambiguity of toile and the dislocation it imposes on the metaphorical rendering of Teneb confronts us with the impossibility of representation. The figure of the shadows that would render them legible translate their obscurity via metaphor is itself lost in obscurity. The reading, uh, this reading would quite precisely stipulate the production of a tautology. If you want, les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des ténèbres. Um, but even this recursive figural recuperation of tautology is insufficient to the positional non-identity of ténèbres and toile imposed by the movement um, uh, from tenor to vehicle, that is by grammar. What we have is an incorporation of the tenor into the vehicle and the irremediable splitting of this movement, its dislocation by one, a division of referential sense, two, the possibility of several meanings, three, the indeterminacy of choosing between the referential division and the symbolic synthesis, and four, the subsequent realization that none of these suffices to recover a stable figure in any case. We begin to see how the elaboration of literary work makes it an object of knowledge, not through interpretation, but through exposition. Demand's reading of obsession is highly uncharacteristic, given his characteristic vigilance, uh, in that it falls into all three of the illusions demarcated by Macheret, empiricist, interpretive, and normative. While the empiricist, empiricist illusion treats the work as a given datum, the normative illusion proposes to modify the work so as to absorb it more thoroughly. It no longer treats the work as given to the extent that it refuses its factual reality, viewing it merely as the provisional manifestation of a still unrealized intention. But Macheret notes that the normative illusion is merely a displaced variety of the empirical, since it, quote, transposes only empirical characteristics of the work by attributing them to a model. This is exactly what Damon does through his recourse to a draft, modifying an empirical element of the published version in order to assimilate it to the interpretive uh, fallacy. His claim that we all perfectly and quickly understand obsession supposes a unitary meaning of the poem that can be secured by reading its public, published form as a trace of an intention uh, legible in the draft. This in turn allows the withering normative judgment um, by Damon that the poem's translation of correspondences into intelligibility is, quote, the least one can hope for in a successful reading. And so Demand diminishes uh, obsession relative to correspondence in this respect. But it is, in fact, Demand who translates obsession itself into supposed intelligibility before attributing this intelligibility to the poem's unsatisfactory reading of its hypogram, correspondences. That is, Demand's interpretation reduces obsession to a lyrical prop for the resistance of another poem to lyrical reading. In doing so, his interpretation exemplifies the problems with each of the illusions diagnosed by Macheret. A unified interpretation secures what the poem says through reference to something other than the poem, the draft, rather than working from what the poem does not say toward the complex discrepancy that it is. By annihilating the negativity of what the poem does not say, it does not say Upin, Demon translates it into a merely intelligible reading of another poem, failing to grasp the resistance of the final tercet to this translation. And to measure the distance between several meanings, rather than either forcing an interpretive choice or forcing an interpretive synthesis, is to locate rather than ignore the dislocation the reticence imposes upon the poem, to cite it again, as Althusser might say, S-I-T-E. One does not register the irreducibility imposed by the word toile upon figural interpretation merely in order to emphasize interpretive indeterminacy but rather to indicate the force of determinacy itself, what Macheret calls the necessity of the work. The being there of d'étoile at the end of the first line of the final tercet is riven between the ease with which it fits into rhyming with ces étoiles and the complex figural ambiguity it installs in opposition to absent stars. It is positioned by the grammar of the sonnet at the end of a line beginning with a conjunctive qualification, may, thus pushing opposition toward opposition. 
At the crux of form and content, we begin to see the word in its location. At the intersection of the poem's apostrophic anthropomorphisms, its strident anti-humanist negations, and its, com and its compensatory gestures of mediation, suggesting a site, uviv, at which the uncanny might either be reconciled or redoubled while dislocating this site, even as it is evoked. Right? We have to ask where. Um, this real complexity, which cannot be attributed to the controlling intention of an author or mitigated by the interpretive decision of a critic, consists neither in the form of the poem nor its content, nor the synthesis of these into poetic meaning, but rather the tension between the way in which figuration is at once located and dislocated, the manner in which this tension, this resistance woven into its, te its texture, makes the poem what it is through what, in its finitude, it does not say. And this is the level at which the determinacy of poetic existence should be situated. I have to leave um, some of the conclusion out, but um, having thus elaborated the determinate silence of the poem, right, situating the dislocation of its unitary sense of intention of interpretation, we can now ask how the distance that separates the work from the ideology it transforms encountered in its very letter, um, uh, that is, how does the work create this distance from ideology? How does the composition of the metaphor we've been investigating transform an ideological field from which it distances the poem? And how does this separate the work also from itself, unmaking it even as it is made? The ideological problem at issue bears precisely upon the function of poetic imagination, specifically the putative power of the imagination to figure its own limits. And this ideological problem will also be at issue in any practice of historical materialist criticism. So for example, Benjamin tells us in Central Park that, quote, the stars in Baudelaire represent a picture puzzle of the commodity. They are inadequate to its puzzling quality. Um, or sorry, uh, represent a picture puzzle of the commodity. They are the, ever the same in great masses, unquote. But insofar as they figure this picture puzzle, they are inadequate, I would say, to its puzzling quality. And they are wished away in obsession, the stars, for precisely this inadequacy. Their light speaks a language we already know. Like commodities, they are the ever the same in great masses, but unlike the commodity form, they do not contain sufficient mysteries and are banished in pursuit of pure indetermination. Perhaps the puzzle of the commodity lives where we are not looking for it. And perhaps it is not legible as a picture puzzle, but rather in the ruse of a signifier that never locks into representation, or in the unfolding of a metaphor whose vehicle captures its tenor in the discrepancies of what it does not say, rather than conveying it toward the coherence of an image. If, like Benjamin, we read, uh, for example, the prostitute as the figural incarnation of the commodity, or if we argue that, quote, the shock experience by which a passerby, uh, by which the passerby has in the crowd, sorry, the shock experience which the passerby has in the crowd corresponds to the isolated experiences of the worker at his machine. And so if we read analogically like that, we recuperate the instability of modernity through the stability of representation. That is, we reify it as correspondence, figure, and image, the illumination of a scene, if only briefly, an éclair, uh, puis la nuit, fugitive beauté. Right, so the line figure is modernity as the fleetingness of fugitive figuration. The line, on the other hand, mais les ténèbres sont elles-mêmes des toiles, resists the reification of the figure it does not quite convey, while presenting itself as the very model, sont elles-mêmes, of metaphor itself. This model is undermined as it is instantiated. My point is that we should question whether th there can be anything like a figure of the commodity. Um, or whether we might do better to limb the contours of the problem of reification where it is not actually represented. But I don't mean to claim that the dislocated metaphor I've been explicating is a recessed metaphor for the impasses of substitution congealed in the commodity. Rather, I mean to say that historical materialist criticism should avoid seeking figural solutions to the riddle of the poem's relationship to history. The signifier tenebre does indeed stand in the Romantic tradition Baudelaire extends and delimits for the limit and at the limit of such figural solutions. Hugo's great sequence, Au bord de l'infini, um, at the edge of infinity, uh, begins with a sentence, uh, Je vais 
j'avais devant les yeux les ténèbres, right? And then l'abîme qui n'a pas de rivage et qui n'a pas de cime était là, morne, immense, et rien n'y remuait, right? And nothing moves therein. The edge of infinity begins with darkness, with shadows, with doubt, and these are there before the speaker's eyes. Imagelessness is presented as image. Here, les ténèbres flows easily into l'abîme. In the romantic imagination, and often in Baudelaire's, the term is potentially exchangeable for a series of signifiers, abîme, goof, l'ombre, uh, muet, etc all of which in one way or another portend the spiritual crisis of the death of God evoked by Hugo in this poem. Yet in obsession we find Les Ténèbres differentiated from this chain of equivalences, um, from le vide et le noir et le nu, by the qualification of but. And it's precisely at this moment of differentiation that the word becomes um, part of a metaphor transforming Ténèbres into something else. The figuration of the limits of the imagination, the figuration of a concession to these limits, is itself delimited by the failure of the figure to compose an image. Hugo's speaker has les ténèbres before his eyes, but when les ténèbres are figured as des toiles, the torn sign into which this shadowy darkness is incorporated transforms it into something other than what is there before me. Um, if I register the split referent of d'Etoile, then what I have before my eyes is not an image, but a material signifier. <laughs> Determining les ténèbres through its indeterminacy, toile becomes the site of signifier at which the figuration, by the romantic imagination of its own limits, is captured and woven into a formal complexity exceeding the parameters of imagination per se. Such complexity requires analysis in order to exist. It exists only as an object of knowledge. And if such analysis does not make it exist, does not separate the literary work from the field of creative intention and receptive intuition, then the poem falls back out of its complexity into the very ideology it has in fact, trans it has in fact transformed. Um, and I'm arguing that that's what happens in de Mons reading of the poem. However, it is, of course, Paul de Mon himself, and now I'm concluding, uh, who offers the most stringent and sustained diagnosis of the sort of methodology um, that would uh, surrender the poem in this manner to figuration or to meaning. The adequation of poetic languages to correspondences between words and things, thereby rendering figural phenomena accessible to the synthesis of the imagination is exactly what Damon critiques as the ideology of the, of the aesthetic, or aesthetic ideology as the, uh, as the editorial assigned title of his volume of, of late essays has it. That's not actually what Damon called that volume. Um, but uh, he's, of course, the primary critic of the ideology of the aesthetic. So to conclude, if Machere's theory of literary production offers the tools for a similar, if less famous, critique of aesthetic ideology, working more in an Althusserian than Derridian register, what is the difference between Machere and Damon? This question will also then bear at one remove upon the relation between Althusser and Derrida. Perhaps what separates them is primarily a matter of emphasis, where Damon presses home the incommensurability of grammar and rhetoric to figural reading, he stresses the disruptive power of figural language, and it is the indeterminacy of referential signification that foregrounds for him the materiality of the signifier. For Machere, on the other hand, it is the silence of the work and the insistence of what it does not say that foregrounds the determinacy of the work itself that makes it what it is, and that bears the trace of the work's own transformation of an ideological field. This may actually be, first and foremost, a rhetorical difference which would be to read it from the side of Daman. But we could also say that it's a political difference, since Machere wants to understand materialist criticism as a science that could function as a form of Marxist practice in the cultural field. Perhaps I want to split the difference. Unlike vulgar critiques, critiques of deconstruction by certain Marxists, Terry Eagleton would be a good example. He loves Machere and you know, he writes his famous response to uh, that he does Spectres of Marx. Um, but uh, unlike vulgar critiques of deconstruction by certain Marxists, I see no reason why its methods should not offer crucial resources to Marxist cultural criticism. 
This is part of what I mean to suggest when I argue that the defiguring distance between several meanings of the word toal is a more apt locus for thinking through and not thereby refiguring the reliance of the value form via the commodity upon the reification of social relationships. The critique of aesthetic ideology is an indispensable element not only of literary criticism, but also the critique of capital. We have learned as much from Marx, who would mediate the distance between Machere and Daman in this respect. To read a word and through it a metaphor through the grammar of the tercet of a sonnet as the locus of poetic determination is to specify where the existence of a poem makes itself manifest as a modality of social being, which is what poems are. In the poem, the word is a pivotal site at which form is determined through rhyme, etoile, toile, um, and suturing the sonnet sestet across its tercets. The word is a key point of grammatical tension between the qualification of may and the indeterminate localization of ou. The word is a rhetorical climax of the poem, which the shift from simile to metaphor is undone by the deconstitution of the metaphor itself. And at the level of content, the word toile absorbs and destroys, through defiguring metaphor, the role of a major romantic signifier, tenebre, in recuperating the limits of the imagination within phenomenal synthesis. To read a word in this way is to read a bit like Lacan. Toile is the point de capitan that not only quilts the poem together, but also unmakes it even as it is made. But whereas the production of a tautology undermines classical logic by reducing its propositions to irrelevance, and whereas the proposition, uh, production of a tautology through Hegel's speculative proposition drives the dialectic toward new levels of conceptual articulation. In the case of the poem, the production of a tautology suspends the literary work within the element of its existence, specified by the constitution of what it is by what it does not say, rather than sublating the suspension into a further movement by making the poem say something else. Is it as uh, a discrepancy between the senses of the term Aufheben that is thus at issue, as always. Uh, suspension or sublation. We have to choose, and rather than suspending this decision, we do choose. The dialectic of poetic determination suspends the poem in the element of discrepancy through which it exists. To grasp the being there of the poem, to situate its existence, we have to sustain the suspension even as we elucidate the parameters of its tension that would enable us to elaborate the work while leaving it as it is. Thanks.